Hello, my name is Daniel Kirkendon, the Associate Minister at Forsyth Church of Christ, and uh, I'm glad you're here watching our, our video of what we do on campus on, on Sunday mornings. It is the, the Christmas season, and I hope that you and your family are having a wonderful holiday time. And uh, if you get the chance, we'd love for you to stop by uh, on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. to worship with us or on Wednesday nights at, at 6 p.m. But until then, uh, I do encourage you to check out our website, facoc.org, number of things you can do there. We want to be a blessing to you any way that we can. So let us know uh, in the communications uh, uh, tab if there's anything that we can do to help you out. Um, hope this video and this, and this message that John's going to bring is a, a wonderful experience and it helps you with something that you uh, are experiencing in your everyday life. Thanks again uh, for being here. We all know it's not about the presents. It's not about the frosted trees, carolers, or snowmen. By now we've had it drilled into us. Christmas is not about toys. It's not about Santa Claus. It's not about a family feast, and no, it's not about your toys either. But what we forget is that Christmas is more than just a story about a baby in a manger. It's a story of longing. They were longing for a savior those 2,000 years ago, aching for redemption and for justice. And though Christ fulfilled many prophecies, there are many more we are still waiting for today. But just like the nation of Israel, we too have hope, a promised return of our Savior. So this year, amongst all the family quarrels, remember this. Christmas, the Advent, isn't over. And as the Apostle John once wrote, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Well, hello there. I'm John Dobbs, preaching minister at Forsyth Church of Christ. And as Daniel said, we are really, really glad that you are spending this time with us, and especially during the holiday season. If you're somebody who's going through a very difficult time during the holiday season, we do have a message from a few weeks ago called When the Holidays Are Hard. And you can find that on our YouTube video, uh, on our YouTube channel, and uh, invite you to check that out if that's your situation. A lot of us are, are not sad during the holidays. A lot of us are smiling and we're joyful and we have a lot of things going on. And, and you know, I wonder if what your picture is of the perfect Christmas. I think some of us have in mind about what a Christmas should look like. And it's, it's so beautiful and serene and there's family gatherings and songs and great food and well-selected gifts and children that know how to behave. But how many of us really have a Christmas like that? I think that there's a, in reality, there's a Christmas that's not as pretty and is a lot more messy. And that's what, what most of us have when we think about Christmas. Things don't always go just the way that we want them to go. And if any Christmas should have been perfect, it should have been the first Christmas. It should have been the time when Jesus was born. But we know already, because we're familiar with that story, that it wasn't a perfect situation and reality interferes there. The New Testament opens up in the first pages of Matthew with uh, emphasizing a theme that runs throughout the whole Bible, and that is that this is God's story. And he's been writing this story from the very beginning pages of Genesis all the way through. There are all of these expressions of a coming Messiah, of the, the Lord coming to be with us. And and he uses a lot of bizarre events and, and mysterious uh, things and odd people and, and unlikely 
uh, heroes in this story. As you read through the Old Testament, you'll see all of those things happening. And when we get to Matthew chapter 1 and the birth of Jesus, uh, we see G that God is still at work. This is a multi-layered story. It has, uh, it's not going to answer all your questions. There's mystery involved in this time, but we're going to focus in uh, on Matthew's account because this is the, the, this is where Matthew focuses is on the, the story of Joseph, Joseph's Jesus story. Let's read through uh, part of this account in Matthew chapter 1, starting about verse 18. It says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. You know, this really is a lot like our Christmas. It's not the one you imagined. It's not the, the, the situation that Joseph imagined as he uh, fell in love with Mary and they planned their marriage and the sequence of events are sort of out of order. And, and it really is kind of a messy story. And I think in a way, that's why we relate so well to Joseph. That's why we, we can understand where, uh, what's happening here. And so... This is where Joseph's Jesus story ends, Emmanuel, God with us. And I want us to think about Joseph for a few minutes uh, and think about who he was and how that contributes to the whole story as we know it. Joseph is one of the quiet heroes of the Bible. Very little is known about, about Joseph. He, somebody wrote that Joseph is known to us only as a dim figure in the background of the gospel narratives. We know he was a carpenter in Nazareth. Uh, we know that he disappears kind of early in the, the life of Jesus. We don't see him in the later years of Jesus' life. Uh, but he is presented as a righteous man, and that's a pretty good title to, to hold. Uh, in Joseph's story, we have no recorded words of Joseph. We don't have him saying anything, but we can sense and we understand the inner turmoil that he's been going through in this situation. He's in a, a very uncomfortable position of having a fiance with whom he's never slept, who is now pregnant. And so uh, there was an interesting thing about the background of that I read in one of uh, Craig Keener's book. Uh, he said that Joseph had no option of giving Mary a second chance, even if he wanted to. Jewish and Roman law both demanded that a man divorce his wife if she were guilty of adultery. And Roman law even treated a husband who failed to divorce an unfaithful wife as a panderer, exploiting his wife as a prostitute. And so really, Joseph is in this position where he, uh, by law, has to put Mary away and to, to divorce her. But the, the truth is that he's in love. And when I think about Joseph's story, that just keeps running through my mind. And it's so evident that he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. He wanted to put her away quietly. There's something kind in Joseph, something that prevented him from having an episode of anger or seeking out revenge. He loved Mary. And he experienced what we can see as a very messy and complicated story. And so Joseph is driven by love. And we look at how Joseph deals with Mary and deals with that whole situation. All we see throughout all of this is that he's driven by his great love. And his great love is a, a super example to us. And, and we ought to all have this, this kind of love and, and, and show it in our family. 
you know, we love uh, our family in spite of flaws and failures. The truth is we live with our family and we can see their flaws and they can see our flaws so clearly, much more than anybody else. And yet we choose to love because that's what families do. And we know that nobody's perfect. That's on display every day. But Joseph, he didn't think Mary was perfect, but he continued to love her. And we need to have that kind of love, to be driven to love in our family and in our commitment to God. He was faithful to the law. Joseph was a righteous man. He cared about what God's law was, and he wanted to obey it. And we need to be uh, a person who is driven by love in our grace with others. I love how he didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. This could have been a very big, uh, ugly episode. And Joseph was trying to keep all of that from happening because he was driven by love. It reminded me of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, where it says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And so before the angel told Joseph what was going on, before he knew, before he, and it's hard for us to think back about that because we know the whole story, but, but there was this moment where Joseph was thinking about the truth that his fiance is pregnant and he has not slept with her. And what am I going to do about that? And he seeks in every way that he can to act in love. And so that's before he really understands what's going on. He's driven by love. But another thing we know from this story is that Joseph is driven by God's guidance. And we look through that uh, dream that he has with an angel, and it's an amazing dream. An angel of the Lord comes to him, and this is the first of three appearances that we know Joseph will experience uh, with angels. And the angel's message is very important. It's very significant. It is a message of historic significance because when the angel begins to speak to him, the angel says, Joseph, son of David. And in saying just that short phrase, he places within context Joseph's life as a descendant of David, receiving the promises of David, uh, noting that, that this is in a, a context of a big, long story that God planned for this to happen. And this is the way that he had it all worked out. And Joseph was a part of, of that plan. His role in the story has to do with his Davidic descent, that he came from King David. And it reminds us that all of this has to do with God's big plan. And so it was historically significant. There's also a circumstantial significance as well. The angel recognizes this is an uncomfortable position that you're in. We know there are things you don't know. So he goes on to explain to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. In just a few verses, the Holy Spirit is mentioned twice, and, and the Spirit's uh, participation in this story is, is very vivid. And so he's uh, twice expressed to be the source of what is inside Mary, baby Jesus. And the Spirit begins, uh, we first read about the Spirit's work in creation back in Genesis. He's a part of that, the world's creation. And now he's a part of this new creation of, of salvation that comes through Jesus. And, and uh, a part of this is mysterious, isn't it, to us, that Jesus, the Spirit is involved with all of this. But, but he does give a sort of context to Joseph. He says, look, uh, Mary has been unfaithful. This is all the plan and the work. Of God. And then there's not only a, a historic significance and a circumstantial significance, there's also a spiritual significance to this as well. Because of two names that the angel says. In verse 21, he says, She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so that name Jesus, in the New Testament, this is the only time where there's any significance attached to. Uh, the meaning of the name Jesus. It wasn't an uncommon name among first century Jews. There were a lot of people named Jesus. Jesus is a Greek rendering of a Hebrew word that uh, in the Old Testament we see show up as Joshua. And it just means Jehovah saves. And so God saves. It's a common name given to, uh, to this baby. 
and Joseph is a common man. And this kind of, I think, relates to us as common people. We don't have to be anybody special for God to love and save. Jesus is the one who is most important. And later, the Apostle Paul would say that uh, in Philippians chapter 2, that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so there's a spiritual significance to the name Jesus. And also, as verse 23 says, as, he, as, as the angel brings this uh, uh, passage from Isaiah to our attention, it says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so a second name here, a name that means God is coming to be with us. And we're reminded of that passage in Isaiah, 6, Isaiah chapter 9. It says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so when I think about what this means, it's so important for us to realize that Jesus coming to be born as a human being and to live life as a human being, just like we do. He understands what we're going through. It's such a comfort to me to know that God is with us and God did experience through Jesus all the things that we experience. In Hebrews 4 and verse 15, the Bible says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet did not sin. So I just have this idea that Jesus coming to earth was a part of, of us understanding who he was and he understanding who we are, God with us. You know, that was all that information was in a dream. And so that's a lot of information from this angel in this uh, short uh, vision. The angel answered Joseph's most urgent questions. Where did this baby come from? What's my role in all of this? And you know the Bible has that kind of information for us. Joseph was driven by love. He was driven by God's guidance as God spoke to him and told him through this angelic appearance all the things he needed to know. And another thing that Joseph was driven by that I think is really important is that he was driven by obedience. In verse 24, Joseph woke up and he did what the angel said. And the Bible says he did not consume their marriage, uh, consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. He did what he was supposed to do, what he was asked to do. And so that, uh, that spirit of obedience is something that is a great example to us as well. Because obedience to God is a top priority. It's not something we ever do perfectly, but it is something that we always strive to do. The more uh, and more closely we obey, God's will and the expressions of Scripture, the commands of Scripture, the more we become like Jesus. And that's what we want to do. We want to become more and more like Jesus. Second John 1 and verse 6 says, This is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. And as you heard from the beginning, His command is that you walk in love. So like Joseph, be driven by love and by God's guidance and by obedience. And Joseph was called a, a righteous man. And so I want to see these kind of qualities in my own life, to be a righteous person. What about you? Do you want to be a, a righteous man or woman of God? Then we're going to have to be driven by these same kinds of things, driven by love rather than by self-service, driven by God's guidance rather than cultural pressures and what other people might expect of us, driven by obedience rather than ignoring God's word and just doing what we want. See, Jesus is not just the Savior of the world. He's your Savior. He's the one who loves you. He's the one who lit, came and lived and died and gave his life. He rose again because he wants to be your Savior. And everything J Joseph and Mary experienced was a part of God's plan to bring Jesus to your life right now. Because G Joseph's Jesus story is the setting for your Jesus story. 
he's allowing he's his story and his experience is just like ours we don't know all the answers we experience things that are hard and difficult but we give our attention and our devotion and our love to the lord so i hope during this christmas season with all the running around and decorating and gift buying and and overeating all the things that we do during this holiday season that you'll take a few minutes and think about joseph in this crucial moment and how he taught us to live in love to seek god's guidance and to do what god says and as a result of that the story that god was writing in joseph's life came about and the story god's writing in your life will come about the way he decides let's have a prayer together god thank you for the amazing story of joseph someone we know very little about but who we see as a key player in the story of the birth of jesus thank you that jesus came thank you that he lived and died for us that he rose again and i pray father that as we think about all of those things during this uh, holiday season that we'll be moved to greater devotion to you and greater admiration for your love and your mercy and to continually be amazed at the mysteries of of living life knowing that you are our god and that all of the unexplainable things can somehow be redeemed and you can be our god and our father forever thank you for that in the name of jesus we pray amen